have you join us at the um, Impact Action uh, Labs uh, first in a series of actionable insights um, uh, telling us about the results of the first phase of the Wayfinder scan. Uh, so next slide, Simon. And so uh, we just want to uh, respectfully acknowledge that we're coming to you today um, from the traditional territories of Treaty 6, Treaty 7, and Treaty 8 First Nations, home to Métis settlements, the Métis Nation of Alberta, and regions 2, 3, and 4 within historical Northwest Métis homeland. We would like to acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations before us. Next slide, please. So just a couple of quick housekeeping things, just to save our bandwidth. Um, if folks would mind going off camera and staying on mute, um, we will be um, recording um, the webinar and posting it. Um, so uh, if anyone who's joining us late or who couldn't join us will have a chance to uh, view this. Um, and if you're having any technical problems, please type that into the chat line. Uh, we've got our magical Michelle Mondeville from our communications department in the background helping anyone with any technical issues. And we'll be having a dedicated Q&A section, uh, but don't wait for that to pop your questions into the chat as they come into your mind. I uh, just put that into the, the chat function. So again, I'm just asking everybody if they can go off camera just uh, to save our bandwidth. Thanks so much. So today we're going to be sharing with you um, how we started uh, this uh, Find Your Future project um, and are very happy uh, to be able to walk through the uh, first report findings. There'll be some ample time for questions and answers um, and a little bit of a dialogue um, after we present the findings. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, turn you over uh, to uh, Doug Holt, um, our Associate Vice President um, of Investments, uh, to start off with some introductory comments. Thank you, Risa. I appreciate the uh, the introduction, and uh, it's very nice to be here with all of you today. So, welcome to my AI colleagues, and uh, a welcome to uh, all of our other ecosystem partners who are working with us so diligently to be these future builders to create that better state for uh, for Alberta, the Alberta of tomorrow. That's going to be more resilient, stronger, and more diversified. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, our ecosystem has matured a lot in the last four or five years, and we've seen. Uh, a lot of new opportunities grow and we've we've brought in new programs you know the accelerators for example being just one of them uh, we have many new new players so many new players and so many different actors in the ecosystem that are out there to support both job seekers and funders as as well as obviously entrepreneurs uh, that it can become it can be a complex web and it can be difficult to navigate and find your way through and then the uh, the rationale for undertaking this project is tied to that it's how do we how do we evolve what we're doing and then create a tool which is what this is it's a better tool for that we can all use so that we can help entrepreneurs and we can help these job seekers and help these funders better navigate find their way through the ecosystem and furthermore it becomes something that we can use together so that we can further refine our offerings and what we're doing in the ecosystem, find where those duplication uh, issues may be or where those gaps might exist. And so it's uh, I'm really grateful for the work that Simon has done on this. And thank you, Simon, for for that. And uh, and a shout out to both uh, Risa John and to Catherine Graham uh, for their work on this project. Uh, I look forward to the findings and look forward to further discussions with all of you. Thank you, Risa. Back to you. So next slide, Simon. So how did we start this journey? So as, as Doug alluded to, about a year ago, we um, conducted a request for a proposal uh, to bring some global accelerators here into Alberta to help uh, with our overall scale up and growth model. And one of the key things that we try to do with those accelerators is connect them and integrate them into the, the Alberta ecosystem, uh, because more that they were integrated into that ecosystem, the better they could support um, the entrepreneurs. And so at our onboarding meeting, and you know, I talked about this um, and actually the individual who asked me the question is is a uh, part of the audience uh, you know Sharif said well Risa that that's great we would love to be connected more with the the um, Alberta ecosystem can you give us an ecosystem map and I said Sharif you bet I can find you that so I headed down you know to talk to one of my colleagues and I said hey can you get me an ecosystem map uh, you know the accelerators are interested in connecting with local investors and local industry surely surely I we we can get that for them 
So this colleague kind of laughed at me, um, pulled open a drawer with a stack of business cards and said, well, this is what I have. I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna ask somebody else. Headed down the hallway, asked another colleague, they had an Excel spreadsheet that they'd been working on for years and putting contacts into. Okay, well, I'm not, I'm not getting uh, much traction here within Alberta Innovates. I'm, I'm going to start looking out into the wider ecosystem. And what I found is that there were a lot of databases. Uh, there were a lot of lists, uh, you know, listing stakeholders, but nothing that looked at it from an ecosystem's perspective to say, what are all of the, the resources um, that would support entrepreneurs at different phases along their client journey. So I was getting a little discouraged. Um, so then I went to my colleague, Catherine Graham, and if you can move to the, the next slide, Simon. And I expressed all of my kind of concerns to, to Catherine, and she goes, well, you know what you need, Risa, um, is a tool, right? Um, not just a list, a tool that's going to uh, catalog the ecosystem in a meaningful way that all of those people who are trying to support entrepreneurs can find the right support at the right time for that entrepreneur to help them on their scale-up journey. And beyond just that, that, that tool should also help connect the ecosystem and help us address gaps collectively together. And I said, yes, Kathy, that is exactly what I want. And then she responded, well, we don't actually have that. And I'm like, okay. But she said, you know what, I'm going to partner with you and let's build it, right? Not only for us, but for the entire ecosystem. And so that's how this uh, Wayfinder project, Find Your Future, got started. And so you'll see there some of the, the, the major questions that we're trying to answer with this process. And so on the next slide, um, when we kind of built this out, uh, we thought about tackling it in three phases. And the first phase is what I call kind of the developmental phase or the building block phase. So first of all, you know, we started by saying, let's gather all of those databases and those lists together. Right. So let's get the, the information that does exist out there in the ecosystem and let's collate that into some logical categories um, and see if we can't, uh, you know, uh, kind of coordinate them, um, all of that together, at least in, into one piece of, of information. And then if we're using this as our developmental phase, before we start building something, um, we want to make sure that it's going to be value added for the users, right? So let's go and ask them. And so that's when we commissioned Simon um, to do a scan for us, uh, because we know that a lot of people have, have gone down this journey before us, um, have made you know very, very great attempts. But what we didn't want to have happen is that we created something um, that wasn't useful, um, it wasn't relevant, and it just sat on the Alberta Innovates Way site. Um, so that's why it was very important for us to engage with you at the, that very early stage. And so many of you participated in that process of giving us very candid feedback um, about what was currently in the system, what wasn't in the system, and what would be beneficial if, if we went down this road. So again, thank you to all of you input into that first phase. So that was kind of our building block phase, and that's where we are right now. Um, and so our uh, target is to have that first collated list um, available on our website in the fall. And of course, today we're presenting the findings from that um, ecosystem stick scan that was conducted. So phase two then um, is how do we now start to translate that into a tool? And that's where we're gonna need all of your help because we can't do this on our own. And so it's a little bit of a call to action to say, join us, join us in translating some of that raw information into a tool that's actually gonna help us um, support entrepreneurs to navigate the ecosystem. And so that's phase two, uh, where we would start to translate that into a tool, but a sustainable tool, right? That uh, becomes relevant with topical information, has the functionality uh, to assist, uh, you know, um, whether it's an entrepreneur or somebody who's supporting an entrepreneur to, to use that um, as an effective tool. And then in phase three, that's then to start to use that tool more to an ecosystem perspective to say, how can we now collaborate um, amongst the ecosystem players, um, even in addressing some ecosystem gaps? So that would be phase three. So those are kind of the three um, kind of phases that uh, we uh, are going to go on with, with this journey. And, and we hope that you kind of join us in this process. So now the part that you've all been waiting for um, is the results of it, that first um, you know, ecosystem scan. Um, so very pleased uh, to um, introduce you to Simon Raby, if you don't know him already. He's the Associate Professor in Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Bissett School of Business. He's also the Associate Director of the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship 
and the founding director of Growth Compass. Uh, that's a center of excellence that delivers evidence-based insights and intelligence on business growth and scaling. He's also the founder and academic director for the Growth Catalyst. Very happy to say Alberta Innovates was a, a funder in that and the Innovation Accelerator Executive Development Programs. Um, his research interests focus on a wide areas of entrepreneurial ventures, um, including growth, scaling up, leadership development, innovation management, entrepreneurial ecosystems, and human resource management. So without further ado, Simon, take it away. Thanks very much, Risa, and hopefully everyone can hear me nicely, loud and clear. One of the things I'd like to start with is really by just acknowledging the investment both in time effort and energy that Alberta Innovates has made in this process. When you look globally at initiatives that are taking place in other ecosystems, um, we are really doing a great job with having the right conversations, having collaborative conversations. And um, it is um, what part of my excitement and enjoyment to see those take place in the ecosystem. So we're already doing some really great things. And I would want us to start from a mindset perspective there. But recognize that this is a journey. OK, so this is a journey of development. It's one that we're all in. Um, many of us on the call today will be from various different ecosystem support organizations. We will be those navigators, we'll be those individuals, boots on the ground, having face to face conversations with entrepreneurs. We'll also be helping them find resources that exist beyond our own organizations that we do not have in our repertoire, but we know that exist out there in the broader ecosystem, whether that be in Alberta, whether that even be nationally or even internationally. And so for us, wayfinding, this notion of wayfinding is hugely important to look at how can we make it more efficient? How can we improve the process? And how do we do that in a collective manner? And so from that perspective, we all have um, a role to play in that. And it's part of our job really across this province to make it easier, more efficient and higher impact for all entrepreneurs that we touch. In terms of today's presentation, you will have received the report, uh, I believe it's probably about 24 hours before. I know you're all busy people, so you may well not have had the time to fully connect with the findings. So today's presentation takes you through those findings um, at a high level. OK, so we're going to go through at a high level. There'll be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end, um, and that will be administered by Jasper Byes, who works for the Impact Action Lab at Alberta Innovates. So there will be an opportunity to uh, engage. So please do save your questions for then and we'll look at how we work. Another aspect that we will be concluding with is um, call to actions, what we've called actionable insights through the Impact Action Lab. We really need you to think about what are the priorities that you would like us to focus on through this process. It's not a determined, fully determined process. You know, there needs to be a degree of exploration and evolution as we're working through um, this process. So it's not prescriptive and we need everybody around this virtual table to support us on um, ultimately um, talking about and confirming what is the best next step for us in this process. So a little bit about the project itself. Well, where do we start? Um, well, we started with interviews. We started with an exploration process. We, we did that because we don't have all the answers. Um, as Risa was mentioning, uh, we all have business cards that are stuck in our drawers. We all have potentially our own maps, our own maps with our own our minds, but also maps that may be down on a piece of paper, even up on a wall somewhere. And so it's very important for us to get a lay of the land to start with. And we conducted that through stakeholder interviews. So those are individuals that represent um, ecosystem support organizations. So a lot of those individuals will be on the call today. And we also conducted what we termed expert interviews. So these are individuals that have participated in helping other ecosystems map what is out there, uh, but also have gone through and have been challenged by that process. And so we wanted to learn what they had experienced in engaging in an ecosystem mapping program. So we, we uh, covered stakeholders across this whole uh, seven uh, pillars of the ecosystem model. This is from Rise of the Rest um, and is a well-known ecosystem model to look at different stakeholders that exist. One of the images that I'd like you to keep in your minds, which emerged through this stakeholder analysis process, is the difference between a shopping mall and 
a, a nice path, a, a highway, if you like, the entrepreneur's highway. What we found is, and what we typically find is a lot of um, the way that we organize ourselves as ecosystem support organizations is like a shopping mall. We have our own individual storefronts. Uh, we advertise to the entrepreneurs who are going to be walking past. We're hoping that we can increase some footfall into the to the mall with this huge banner, the entrepreneurial ecosystem mall. But the reality is that there's a lot of entrepreneurs do not set out on the journey to even come to the mall in the first place. A lot of entrepreneurs are working very long hours. One of the things that we know is that it's it's very challenging setting up and starting a company, not least scaling and growing a business. Most of the hours are dedicated towards that. And so actually spending a day to just pop to the local mall and to look at what's on offer and what's available is very challenging for entrepreneurs. They don't always have that time. However, that is typically how ecosystems globally have, have organized themselves. We all believe as these different uh, stores in the mall, that we have something valuable to offer. And we do, we have a place, we have a role to place. There are over 300 support organizations alone across Alberta looking for the attention of entrepreneurs. It's a bewildering array of organizations for the average entrepreneur who's just looking to start and scale their business. The right hand side is different. During our stakeholder interviews, we actually spoke to one particular individual who raised this analogy. They spoke to the fact that, well, actually, shouldn't it be about the entrepreneurial highway? Shouldn't it be about that we are working together as the entrepreneurial ecosystem, looking down and, and from the side of the entrepreneurial highway, looking at where entrepreneurs are stalling, where they're faltering, where, the, where some are actually speeding up, and the different types of, types of support they need. So we're that support crew that can run out onto that highway and actually help those entrepreneurs get started, start back up again, scale and move forward and accelerate their journey. And so that approach requires a different mindset. It requires a, a shift in the way that we share data, for example, and we'll talk a bit about that. It requires a shift in other components as well of the way we work together. So these are just two different images that I'd love you just to keep in your mind and think about how your experience overlays on these when we think about the Alberta entrepreneurial support ecosystem. So our way into the conversations when we conducted these with the stakeholders was to actually talk about the current state. OK, so we wanted um, to think about the mapping process as an example. How is this currently done? Um, how are maps currently created? And so that's where we focused. Now, the reality is, and what I got from a lot of stakeholders that we interviewed, and we interviewed over 40 organizations, over 80 individuals from those organizations, um, we ultimately identified that mapping alone is, is inadequate. OK, so a lot of you would saying that, yes, as ecosystem support organizations, mapping is useful because it helps us as an organization differentiate what we do compared to others. It allows us to position what we do compared to others. However, it's not a, alone. It's not enough. The reality is that actually the interactions that we have between entrepreneurs are um, very social, they're very personal, they're on the ground. And it's important, therefore, to have a, 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 a relationship with the entrepreneur and with specific entrepreneurs. And so that relationship cannot be boiled down to a map. OK, and so maps are a supportive process for the entrepreneurial support ecosystem, but they're not good enough alone. And so this notion of this navigator role really came through strongly. OK, and this navigator role was all about individuals like yourselves, but not only in the public sector, but also the private sector. OK, so quite often when we'll think about the entrepreneurial support ecosystem, we'll go to those schemes that are grant funded, that are often funded by the province, the feds, but also at a local, more municipal level. And the reality is, is that navigators actually exist um, a lot often in the private sector as well. And so when we talk to entrepreneurs, we know that some of their first stops often is their local accountant. It's their lawyer. It's these other individuals in the ecosystem that we also have to recognize as being truly important within the process. OK, so that's all really important. So we have to bear in mind then it's about this trusted relationship and that maps augment that they support that, but they're not a replacement for it. And so previous attempts to create maps have often um, fallen flat. Um, and we'll talk about some of those examples today because they haven't always incorporated this notion of this personal 
um, relationship, this one-to-one -one context, which is really important. So to give you a, a bit of a background as well of what, how have other ecosystem support organizations mapped the ecosystem? OK, so the reality is there's levels. So we identified these particular approaches to ecosystem mapping. So it just helps you to, again, position yourself in terms of what you're doing in your own organization and what others are doing, but also what are some of the gaps that exist? So one of the primary methods and mechanisms is actually a service list, a registry list. Many of the individuals we spoke to through the stakeholder interview spoke about the need to map the stakeholders that currently exist. It's a current state of play, if you like, and present those just merely as a list. Think of a yellow pages. Think of going on Kijiji and, and finding something. You click on that button for, um, I don't know, a chest of drawers and you get all the chest of drawers. It doesn't distinguish between organizations. It doesn't really help you navigate those organizations or really look at the difference between those organizations. So in the majority, that's what we're doing. One of the more advanced approaches from a service list perspective is one actually being used and using a software package called Kumu. And so Kumu actually presents it in a really nice graphical form. Another option is a service journey. And so the service journey focuses very much on um, actually the journey of entrepreneurs, but against the startup commons development phase model. So many of us will be aware of the startup commons model that goes from a minus two all, to, all towards a plus two. And so many ecosystem organizations have used that model to align their services against. We'll talk a, a little bit about the challenge with that, particularly to do with scope creep um, later on when it comes to how we align ourselves against it, but also the language. You know, what I interpret validation to mean um, to organizations in the ecosystem where I am could well be very different to what others uh, deem to be validation as also in the eyes of the entrepreneur and what they think by that word. The ecosystem connection piece was rarely done. So what we find is, is that very few organizations, and this is a resource uh, issue, you know, we are resource scarce, um, many of our organizations, um, depending on the funding we get. The funding isn't allocated towards marketing or it's not allocated towards developing um, the model or the map for the ecosystem connection. So very few of us are mapping relationships or the rules that govern the ecosystem to help entrepreneurs and give them tip-offs of how the ecosystem is working and therefore how they need to work. At the bottom of this model is this ecosystem journey, the enhancement journey. What this speaks to really is the need for us to actually work together to build an open system, an open process where we look at the entrepreneur's journey. And so this is one actually where the entrepreneur creates their own data profile as an example, and we're accessing that data profile. And so what that helps us with is it actually helps us to understand the entrepreneur's journey, uh, the entrepreneur's historical journey, but also what their future journey could be and how we fit into that. There are few, if any, organizations currently approaching the ecosystem from that perspective. It requires an organization, potentially in Alberta Innovates, to convene the conversation, to help guide and support and actually to invest in that kind of development. So when we look at um, mapping, and I've spoken about mapping just there, and we obviously looked at the different approaches, um, we do focus largely on the roles at the moment. OK, so we sp focus on the roles in the ecosystem, but that overlooks things like relationships. It overlooks things like rules. It also overlooks things like the results that that particular ecosystem is achieving and the resources that are being input to the ecosystem. So from a complex systems perspective, there are lots of different things we can measure. And we're really just scratching the surface around what is it that each of us actually do and, and how do we best share that approach? And so these are things that we need to think about um, as we map and as we think about what's appropriate and important to map. So the number 21, why is the number 21 important? Well, that's how many ecosystem assets we found. So when it comes to um, maps, when it comes to registries and service lists, um, when it comes to online programs and software packages, there's currently 21 that have been created. The large, large majority have been created in the last three to five years. So if we've created 21 in the last three years or so, how many more could we potentially create in the next three 
plus years in the future? And how more confusing or bewildering could it become to entrepreneurs as they engage in this system? So this is something, again, that we want to think about. We have catalogued uh, the audit that we undertook in the report. So you'll find the different approaches that are being taken. And one of the recommendations, the actual insights that come out, come out of this report is for us to actually display these resources on one central website. And so that's something that I know Catherine Graham will speak about towards the end of this presentation as we move to that. But let's start and talk about actually the entrepreneur's journey. So I had you um, think in that mindset shift from the entrepreneurial mall to the entrepreneurial journey. I just want to check in at this point in the presentation that obviously everyone's hearing me OK, Risa, and that everything's going well before I move on to the, the results presentation. You've got lots of thumbs up, so I think we're good to go. Fantastic. Um, you never know when you're presenting to a screen um, that everyone's hearing you, so I'd hate for uh, there to have been any technological problems. So I had you uh, envisage this image of a shopping mall and this image of an entrepreneurial highway. So when we think of the entrepreneurial highway, we're thinking of the entrepreneurial journey and we're thinking about the ability for us to look historically back at the record of what the entrepreneur has done to date and what they could potentially do in the future. Now, what we find is, is that when we start probing around, well, why isn't this something that we typically do? It's a resource thing. There are organizations currently that do have organizational level customer relationship management systems. A CRM is a typical thing that all of us would have within our organization. The reality is the CRM therefore is within the boundaries of our organization. It doesn't always extend or be shared beyond. We're obtaining approval from that entrepreneur that we as an ecosystem organization can share data with that entrepreneur. So that data could be a newsletter, it could be upcoming opportunities, but it's down to us as an individual support organization to make those choices of what we think is appropriate for the ecosystem organization. And so they have to um, ultimately enroll, they have to register with as many ecosystem organizations as they can um, possibly register with. And so this kind of becomes a game of how many can I register with and can I do the work to read through all of these e-newsletters? Can I as an entrepreneur do the work to really think about um, what I need and what my next best step is? And the reality is it is bewildering when you think about what it would be like on the receiving end of 300 support organizations across this province. Now, there are some organizations that are keeping quite detailed notes on entrepreneurs. OK, and those are organizations that have the resources to do that. So you'll know who you are, but those organizations that have client facing staff that conduct interviews, there are thousands of interviews and needs assessments being undertaken across the province. And then that needs assessment process is stored, might be a 30 minute conversation. It's again stored somewhere, maybe in the CRM, maybe in a separate document. But again, it isn't shared. And so overall, we have a bit of an unlevel playing field. Some stakeholders on the call today will be challenged because they don't have the resources. They don't have the money to actually undertake that process. And so you're already at a, um, a faltering start when it comes to that. Other organizations that have the resources could be potentially better using those resources on other things rather than having to recreate that process themselves. So if we had a more of a centralized process that we could um, work together on how, what would that look like and how could that work? So, but to get to that point and to get to this notion of an entrepreneurial highway, um, there are a number of other things that we also need to recognize. And there are a number of constraints that the stakeholder analysis um, surfaced. I'm just going to talk through these six constraints that we have. OK, so we have um, the element of low market awareness. We have vague language. We have an incomplete needs assessment. We have the navigator learning curve. I mentioned that role of the navigating navigator earlier, and I'll speak to that in greater detail. And we also have this notion of a nearsighted concierge. So I'm going to talk about these elements and what they mean. Um, and all of this, remember, is findings from stakeholders, all of you that are on the call today. So some of this you'll be looking at and you'll probably be nodding and smiling and going, yeah, like I, I can see where this is coming from. But other things, if you don't see it in here, we'd love you to come forward with it. So this is a one point in time. We've drawn that line. 
this is an ongoing conversation about what these constraints are and how we overcome these challenges collectively as an ecosystem. So let's start with vague language. I call it vague language because there are a range of different areas that we're using language when it comes to the support we're providing. The reality is, is that we're using our own, I can term this code books. Um, there's a code book that we use in the ecosystem. This code book has various different elements to it. Take entrepreneur as an example. Um, in Calgary, um, we call them founders. Um, we also call them tech entrepreneurs. In more rural regions, we end up calling them business owners, or we call them just entrepreneurs. And so actually, even from an entrepreneur perspective, there's an urban versus rural divide that we have to respect. However, if we're then issuing marketing, which is at a more global provincial level, we might not be attracting those individuals that we want to to the programs that we're running with. And that's largely because they don't see themselves in that language. And so it's really important to think about how we can locally um, gear ourselves to this language, but also respect that at a, at a more centralized level as well. When it comes to enterprise, we have a similar issue. So we talk about technology um, intensive companies. We talk about technology enabled companies. We talk about innovation driven companies. When I asked stakeholders, what, are, what do these all mean? You know, wh wh where are we getting to with these? No one could clearly articulate what we mean by these terms, but they're terms that we use every day. OK, so there's a glossary of terms that we need to think about that if we are going to use these terms, we need to be clear about what they are and we need to be clear about how we're all articulating them. The evolution component speaks to the models we use. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of us are using this startup development phase model. It's a great model. Startup Commons has really helped us to at least start to speak the same language. Um, we can talk about the early phases of growth and startup using that model. The reality is that when we talk about scaling up and growth, which is the latest stages, that model biases those early stage uh, phases of growth. OK, so they bias all the way from um, early stage development all the way to validation and commitment. When we get to scaling, it just says scaling. When we get to establishing, it just says establishing and we get to leading, that's all it says. But what do we mean by scaling? Surely scaling needs to be blown up and, and is warranted to blow up in its own right into its own phases of what scaling actually involves and not just relying on those early startup phases. So that's something that we need to think about as an ecosystem is how do we help a model like that mature in our ecosystem so that we can use it? And then we get onto the ecosystem. So the ecosystem, as we recognize it, and I'm you know, thankful and highlight the work of Alberta Innovates and, and its partners, that we're now recognizing that the ecosystem biases largely early stage organizations, early stage ventures. And so a lot of us will talk and use the language of top of, top of the funnel. OK, so we're looking at top of the funnel because if we get more in the top of the funnel, then the idea is, is that we have more organizations that flow through. But we also know that there's a significant um, rate of failure amongst new organizations. You know, the majority, at least 50 percent fail within their first five years. And so we need to also be thinking about how do we catalyze the growth of organizations beyond that startup phase? And so there are programs that are now coming in to support that phase, but it's just a start. And so how do we knit together this top of the funnel through the, and get the flow through and the deal through through to the to the back end of that model as well. And so that's really important from this perspective. And so when we we're talking actually about um, analogies, we used an analogy for each one of these constraints and for entrepreneurs and the way stakeholders spoke to us about it is they kept saying it's a bit like to an entrepreneur setting out on a journey and realizing the map you picked up at a gift store is in a different language. And so what they're experiencing potentially is, a, is an array of different languages that's circling around the ecosystem. Um, and at the end of the day, they just want to start or grow their company. OK, so a lot of the time we need to need to simplify things and we need to use their language and think about how we do that when it comes to those client facing activities. The low market awareness piece focuses more about the reality that we are all quite nascent in this ecosystem. You know, the ecosystem, if you think about the large focus and energy and effort that's gone into it, it's probably over the last five years. Clearly, there has been a lot that's happened as an ecosystem last over the last 10 to 20 years. But in terms of really the development, the use of the frameworks and tools, et cetera, it's still relatively new. 
And so when it comes to entrepreneurs, the awareness, say, of Alberta Innovates at a provincial level or the awareness of more local regional innovation networks, um, other organisations that are members of those RINs is, can be quite low. The other side of this is that those stakeholder organisations do not always have, you do not always have your own marketing budget. Again, this comes back to the level playing field issue is how can all organisations across um, the ecosystem be supported to get their message out there and to help differentiate them um, so that entrepreneurs clearly understand where they need to go for what and where and when. And so this is about, um, and again, this is an analogy that was used by stakeholders that entrepreneurs can see this sort of support ecosystem on the horizon. They see them all from a distance. Um, most believe, however, does it really exist? Um, when I start getting involved in this, how much time and effort and energy do I need to put in to really access it? And so a lot just are not able to access it um, because it takes a lot of energy and effort to really focus on that. This is improving, but it's something that I know we can work together more on. Number three was about incomplete needs assessment. So one of the things that we, we heard about um, uh, and Jasper, thank you for posting that. If you have questions as they come up along the way, please feel free to post them. We will uh, be able to address them at the end of the presentation. So when it comes to incomplete needs assessment, what we're hearing is, is that there's thousands of meetings that are taking place across the province every year directly with entrepreneurs. Now, those meetings are happening typically with us between a specific ecosystem organisation and um, ultimately an entrepreneur or a set of partners. Um, now, the reality is, therefore, is that data is owned and is over overseen by that specific ecosystem organization. And so there's huge value currently being locked, landlocked into our individual organizations that's not being shared about this entrepreneur's journey. What it also means is that we also typically have our own intake processes. So we have our own nuances about how we want to assess the needs of an entrepreneur. That is a challenge in its own right, because even if we then said, hey, today we're going to open up all this data, we're going to find a way to share it, a lot of it will not be common. A lot of it will be different questions, different approaches. And so what it's, what's important about this is to think about is how do we actually work on something potentially together that could support the development of a common needs assessment process? And how do we actually get deeper, not just focus on these top level symptoms, the, the things we see and the things the entrepreneur says they need, to actually what the entrepreneur needs. A lot of you I know will have met with entrepreneurs like I have, and they'll say, do you know what? I really need sales and marketing support. And the deeper you get into the organization, the more you recognize actually the entrepreneur themselves needs to step up, needs to take a more strategic role, and needs to actually strategically build and develop the business, but do other things than just sales and marketing, which can often be a bit of a, uh, a plaster, uh, a quick fix, they may well not have product market fit. They may well not have um, product business model fit. And so it's important to think about all these other things that are going on and focus on those causes. And sometimes our current needs assessment processes do not get at the heart of that. OK, and so that's what, what we need to think about. And the last thing I would say is, and this was raised by a particular stakeholder um, that's doing a lot of work with the ecosystem, is that we can often treat uh, entrepreneurs as a homogenous group. What do I mean by that? Well, there are entrepreneurs who are what are termed subs subsistence entrepreneurs and there are transformational entrepreneurs. So if you look at some of the literature around different types of entrepreneurs, some subsistence entrepreneurs are those who run a small business. Um, they provide employment for themselves and a small staff, but they typically do not grow. They're organizations that I often call trundlers. Uh, they continue on. Um, they're going to be there. They struggle through, but they're not necessarily high growth ventures or have the potential for high growth. Whereas transformational entrepreneurs are really looking to really grow and build their businesses. The intakes processes at the moment, both of those types of individuals can go into the same intake process. Is that right? I don't know. It's a question that we need to ask. Is there a way that we should be dealing with those types of entrepreneurs in a different way? Yes, we do not always want to pick winners. We need to provide support and open and inclusive support to entrepreneurs. But we also need to think about how we best respond to that support. What does that inclusive support really look like um, so that it hits the mark? And so this particular analogy came up from stakeholders, which at the moment from a needs assessment process, it's a bit like an entrepreneur arriving at a hospital and meeting a specialist. 
Each time they arrive, they meet a different specialist and every meeting they're asked to explain their entire family history. OK, so if you can imagine how frustrating that might be, but also how much time they spend in this uh, needs assessment loop, some of them never exit the needs assessment loop. Um, and that's something we need to think about, because also a specialist, you're just luck. There's serendipity and chance involved in. Are you going to get the, the right specialist first or one that has a little bit more of a generalized knowledge? Nearsighted concierge. So what are we referring to when it comes to the nearsighted concierge? So ultimately, um, I mentioned about individual stakeholders collecting their own data on the entrepreneur. And so this ultimately builds an incomplete picture of what's going on for the entrepreneur, what they've done already previously before meeting you, but also what they're thinking of doing moving forward. When we look at actually, well, how could we open up those processes? At the moment, there's not a huge incentive to invest in a handoff process to other providers. It's something that we need to think about. Um, some providers are more open than others in terms of how do we actually create those handoffs. Some have less resources than others. So actually handoffs take time. All this stuff takes time. So we need to think about that. And so I mentioned about this notion of being in this needs assessment loop in this nearsighted concierge, we can end up bouncing entrepreneurs around the ecosystem. And sometimes entrepreneurs will get to the second or third bounce, they'll have that other meeting with another specialist and they'll be like, do you know what? It's going to be better if I just just continue on and just push forward. And so we don't want entrepreneurs to become demoralized or disheartened by this process. And we need to think about how we be inclusive in that process. And so from a notion of needs assessment and also nearsighted concierge, we need to have a triage process um, where there are a number of specialists that could help with the condition the entrepreneur has. Um, the fortunate entrepreneurs are provided with direct int introductions and handovers. Um, so that's great. So there are a lot of entrepreneurs that are provided with that, uh, with that direct introduction. And that's because of the expertise of the individual they meet. Uh, it's, it's great. And some of you are more generalist in your approach. However, what we find is, is in most times, the analogy that's used is that they're just handed the yellow pages and they're told, here we go. Here, here's the service and registry list check out some of these organizations. I know that they can help you. And so that's a thing that we need to um, come over and get over is this needs assessment loop that just keeps happening. So the service provider scope and integration. So this speaks to, and I've mentioned this notion of the, in the concept, uh, the conceptual framework of the startup commons model. And so there are service providers and Alberta Innovates is doing this to an extent as well that are aligning themselves to this startup commons framework because it's one of the few that exists. Um, however, what we've noticed when we've seen stakeholders um, or we've asked the process, and this has happened sometimes through regional innovation networks where a RIN will say, we want to um, align our members, help differentiate our members so we know how we can support entrepreneurs to navigate the ecosystem. Um, everybody says they do everything. And so what happens is, is that what starts as a model of differentiation ends up becoming a model where everybody just says, yeah, I can cover all of these 50 stages. And so this is a challenge and you can understand why this, this happens because, because organizations have you know, varied resources, some have less than others. Um, some have less resources when it comes to therefore marketing, when it comes to getting out into the ecosystem. There's this probably a fear of missing out that if I say that I don't do something, then I might not capture that entrepreneur who's just looking in that space. And I, and I probably will be able to do something. But then we all end up over investing on the entrepreneur's journey outside of our core offer. And so this is something, again, that there could well be efficiencies within the ecosystem if we all stick within our lanes. And so, again, this analogy sort of came up that entrepreneurs think that they found the right support provider that they can they can help or that it can help their support. Um, their organization, but at an attendance at the meeting, they quickly realize that the specialist advice that they require is not available and they get referred to another specialist where they have to dig deeper into that area of concern. And so you get bounced between these different specialists in the ecosystem. Um, some can find that on the first bounce, others might not find that depending on the approach they go through. To finish off, the sixth area was this navigator learning curve. So I, I raise this notion of a navigator at the beginning. Um, we know that we're all navigators. Now, we have often dealt with us at an organizational level, 
but we're all individual navigators and we all have our own expertise. We all have our own learning journey around the ecosystem that we brought to our organization we're with. But we also know that we know a lot more about the ecosystem than actually just our organization provides. And so what this starts to raise the question around is what do we do for navigators? There's currently no program out there across the ecosystem that brings navigators together to share best practice and knowledge. There isn't a program that encourages um, navigators to learn about some of the updates that might be taking place. We all have to do that at a local level. We're all trying our best to keep up to date. And when it comes to navigators, I mentioned this notion of this public versus private. A lot of private sector individuals who are navigators would not even currently be included in our mind around this approach. And so how do we actually identify who those navigators are? Um, could they fit into a model or a system where we're different levels of navigator, depending on how much time we've been in the ecosystem or how much we know? And how do we keep up skilling a navigator? The reality is the learning curve is lengthy for a navigator. If you're brand new into the ecosystem, into an ecosystem support organization, it's going to take a bit of time. It's the same with these global accelerators. Um, Risa highlighted Sharif at the beginning of the call. Sharif and I had a great conversation. He is a representative, one example of a global, um, which we're very thankful to have into this province, but a global accelerator that's come into the province. Those sort of individuals who are brand new into the province, we don't want them to have to take six, nine, 12 months to learn the ecosystem. We want to be able to give them a crash course in how the ecosystem works, just like we would with an employee in our organization. How do we do that? How does that get administered? How does that get supported? And so this is an analogy we had from an, e an individual from an ecosystem support organization. They said, look, I've recently joined an ecosystem support organization. I'm a recent entrepreneur. Um, I've experienced many of the ac accessibility challenges that other entrepreneurs like me have experienced. I'm excited to join this organization. On my first day, um, I'm greeted by my colleagues who have worked in the ecosystem for many years. Um, I ask what I believe is a simple question. Can you point me to a guide to the ecosystem? The key kind of sources of information that I need just to get up to speed in my first week or two. And you quickly learn that the knowledge is actually tacit knowledge. It's in the head of your colleagues. And so they're going to have to be very patient while you learn the ropes and while they download on you over the coming weeks. And so that is part of this process is how do we therefore support that and speed that up? And so we come full circle back to these different images, uh, this mindset shift from the mall, the ecosystem development mall to the ecosystem and entrepreneurial highway and thinking about that. In terms of actual insights, so we have eight actual insights that have come out of this report and these are all from your stakeholder perspectives. There's no overlay of our views or perspectives being placed on that. Today is a presentation to share what we've learned from you. OK, so this is not being prescriptive. This is just saying, hey, there's some stuff out here that we might want to think about. And how do we prioritize this? So there's a project which Catherine will talk about later um, in the uh, Impact Action Lab that we have investment and support going into a process that we can choose as an ecosystem on how that time and effort and energy gets allocated. And so we have eight actionable insights here, but where do we go first? OK, so when we talk, look at these, these particular aspects, the needs assessment. So we've covered the needs assessment. It wouldn't it be great if we had a shared common needs assessment across the province? What would that look like and what would that provide to us to then be able to share data from that needs assessment process. That could inform the entrepreneur highway and this entrepreneur's data profile. And so there's a question around, what do we want to do with a needs assessment? The other question is around accessible services. So a lot of entrepreneurs are not nine to 4 p.m. people, not nine to 5 p.m. people. Um, they're out of office hours type people. But if they can't get access to the data or the information during those out of office times, what do we do about that? Um, do we need to have more of a digital support, more of a system, um, some bots that actually support them to help guide and find the approach? There's technology out there. We talk about technology firms. We've got technology. We can build technology to actually make services more accessible outside of the normal nine to four or nine to five. Scale up fellows. 
So um, this is uh, an area around the current ecosystem that we have entrepreneurs going through and participating in lots of accelerator programs. OK, um, this is all feeding into and part of the model around um, the fund and fellowship. And Risa is the director of the fund and fellowship program, and she's super awesome and excited to build this. These individuals that graduate from these programs who are entrepreneurs, who are leaders of organizations, they become scale up fellows. But what do we want to do with them? How do we want to use them? How do we want to ask for their support? What does that program look like to keep them engaged and keep them helping others in the ecosystem? The common language and tools, we, we spoke about that. We spoke about do we want to align on the language we use? Do we want to at least recognize and have a glossary for terms and terminology? So all of across the province, we can align around those. And where do we keep tools in a common space that we can all access? Look, those 21 maps and systems that have already been created and we can we can benefit from. The entrepreneur scale up journey. OK, so this is about the entrepreneurs um, ultimate approach to the startup commons model. So we use the startup commons model at the moment, but the question is, is should we blow up and expand and investigate specifically the scale up part of that journey? Should we conduct some data analysis and work with entrepreneurs to identify what are the common characteristics of what entrepreneurs do in that area, which are different to starting up? We know starting and scaling are different. We know leaders need different skills and capabilities and capacities. It's not the same. And so if we're looking and focusing more on scale up and growth in the future to support startup, we need to get there. Navigator accreditation, do we want to anoint all of us on the call today? Do we want to label ourselves as navigators? Do we want to present ourselves on a navigation website? Do we want to attend annual leading and learning forums around navigation? OK, do we want to do those sorts of things, keep ourselves updated, have content being launched into that navigator ecosystem so that we can all stay updated, but not have to invest too much at a local level um, and over invest on those things? Customer driven marketing, I mentioned that it's partly related and a lot of these you'll know is they're intertwined and it's not easy to separate and say we're just going to do one of these. Um, but this does focus on the labels that we use to uh, with businesses. And so how do we how do we actually um, label entrepreneurs? How do we attract them to our services? But the customer driven marketing approach can happen with an entrepreneur's data profile. So what we mean by the customer driven marketing is if the entrepreneur controls their own data profile and is updating that, we can see the stage in, of development they're, they're coming to. We can see their calls and ask for support. We can all see that on the platform and we can respond to that. And so marketing that actually can go out to entrepreneurs can be target, targeted far more in a, in a more granular level, uh, depending on how that kind of tool is designed. And so really we're moving towards that and away from maps. Maps are still important. Um, Risa will mention about um, the maps that we've actually been creating. So we will be uh, building and have will be launching some static maps, really, which are very useful for us as an ecosystem uh, to understand how we work and what else is out there. But when it comes to the entrepreneur, what is it that we want to do that's specifically for them to make sure they get the value that they need um, from the ecosystem in the right approach? One of the other things that I'll just finish off with this before handing over is scale up enterprise support. It wasn't a core question of the survey and the, the stakeholder interviews, but we did raise the question of um, what is the support we should be providing to scale up enterprises? And so you'll see in the report that there is basically, um, and I'm going to skip past the defining scale up, there isn't consensus, let's just say around what a scale up is and how we define one. Um, but there was a list of support that started to be created around these are the things that we know are knotty issues, are cruxes, challenges that entrepreneurs are starting to approach us with. And we don't really have the answers at the moment. We need to interpret these uh, areas with caution because we only interviewed certain numbers of stakeholders. We didn't confirm and triangulate this with entrepreneurs themselves. So at some point in the future, we may want to conduct a piece of work around that of what are some of these other knotty, thorny issues we need to help scale ups overcome um, when it comes to the ecosystem. So I know there's going to be a poll, Jasper, um, with the actual insights. Which one of those eight would you say we should be starting with? Are there any others? And you can obviously put comments into the chat function that you think we should be covering 
And remember that this is an ongoing conversation. So even though we might not have time today, um, ultimately to continue the conversation in this um, area, we will be reaching out after the call. And I know Risa will be talking about that approach to actually have more of a discussion around these findings. Once you've had the time to di uh, digest the report, its findings, but also, you know, we've thrown a lot at you today. So we'd love to circle back on this at some point in the future. So really just at this point, it's just a quick poll to see where everyone's landing. Um, and I know Jasper, you're going to just launch that. Thank you, Simon. I'm newly excited just hearing this again today. I think just in the interest of time and getting people out the door on time for their next meeting, I think I might just hand over to Catherine for the closeout and we will uh, take our poll question into the follow-up email. So Catherine, you. handing over to you. Thanks, Jasper. Thanks very much, Simon. Very jazzed to hear all of this. Um, um, as uh, was said earlier, um, this is a three phase uh, project. There will be uh, three reports. This is the first approach. Um, in terms of uh, next steps, um, there will be the Wayfinder map available. Um, also, the report, a high level uh, report, will be available on our website. And uh, really part of this philosophy is, as Simon pointed out, is an iterative process from one phase to the other and um, really wanting to complement the, the great work that's already happening in the province and in enhancing it together. So in terms of the second phase is really an engagement um, approach uh, with our partners, with the um, entrepreneurs uh, to enhance the great work in terms terms of um, um, having that uh, seamless journey for the entrepreneurs to help them and support them right service at the right time by the right people um, um, in helping them scale and grow their business. So very exciting. And um, as Simon um, highlighted, uh, very much an engagement co-developed process in terms of options and navigating. Um, so um, just a few uh, kind of public announcement alerts um, and keeping in the theme of navigation and journey um, just to do a save the date and November 29th to December uh, 2nd um, with a fund and fellowship. Um, hosted by Fund and Fellowship, Risa, and the Investments uh, Unit for a Roadmap for Growth Learning Forum um, uh, to continue on with this engagement, um, uh, just to let you know that. Also to let you know in terms of the Impact Action Lab, um, we're planning um, in partnership within the Investments Unit um, a number of other actionable insights um, the body of work uh, is in uh, network effects in terms of um, um, how network effects helps us in terms of uh, economic social impact. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Grant will be uh, doing a presentation on regional innovation networks um, for Southern Alberta, and then Dr. Jeff Gregson for meta-analysis um, of uh, networks, so stay tuned for that. And then lastly, in the last minute, I'll hand over to Teresa, but just to let you know, uh, just thanks for the opportunity to launch the Impact Action Lab. We're a new uh, business unit who um, our purpose is to work with ecosystem players to amplify and activate economic and social impact of our research and investment. So great opportunity here, very jazzed. Over to you, Risa. Everyone, thank you again for joining us uh, for the first in the Lunch and Learn series. Um, we will be recording the or the recording um, uh, will be posted on the Alberta Innovates website as well as the report. So I'll be sending all of you a follow up email with all of those links and information, and also a big ask please join us on this journey. We'd like to convene a follow-up group, uh, you know, to uh, get your responses and, and feedback um, about this and talk about next steps. So when I send that follow-up email, I hope I get lots of replies back saying you're going to join us on this journey. Thank you again um, and a uh, good rest of your day. Thanks everyone.